I said, my daughter's been missing for five days. This is the last known place. People are generally saying to me, one of you are gonna end up dead. Looks like somebody was making a cabin or a, or a campsite and there's some fresh dirt that it looks like there had been a hole dug. And I walked over to the top of the grave and I smashed her face in. What do you think made you angry about that? That she wasn't fighting anymore. The following stories tell the tale of three supposedly grieving girls who took the lives of their ex-partners. We have two teen girls who brutally took the life of a girl who had done nothing to hurt them, a model who took the life of the father of her children, and a group of teens who worked together to kill a 15-year-old boy. Pennsylvania Superior Court is denying an attempt by a Crawford County murder defendant to withdraw a five-year-old guilty plea. Ashley Barber was just 21 years of age when she pled guilty to the brutal 2013 beating death of Brandy Stevens, admitting to holding down the victim while the co-defendant, Jade Olmstead, hit the victim repeatedly in the head with a shovel. Barbara pled guilty to first degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. This is the story of a bright young life cut tragically short. Brandy was beloved by all who knew her. She was a happy, happy, happy child. She had that contagious outgoing energy that, that people just loved. She was the kind of person that people looked up to. Brandy was selfless and intelligent. I loved others. She's who I want to be when I grow up. You know, she's a wonderful human. But Brandy's life was not without difficulty when she was growing up. She had some questions about her identity and who she was as a person and who she was attracted to. While it may have taken some time for Brandy to come to terms with who she was, her mother never stopped accepting her. I accepted her. She was amazing. Brandy's friend, Christy, was there for her every step of the way. She confided in you and really looked to you for guidance. Mm -hmm. Did Brandy have a hard time with her identity? In the beginning, she did, yes. So I tried to help her through that, tell her it's okay, just be yourself. Eventually, she was able to do just that. She grew into the person she was supposed to be. She headed off to college at Yellowstone State, where she studied psychology and sociology. She had big plans for her future. She wanted to help other people, including her own girlfriend, Jade Olmstead. What were some of your first impressions of Jade? When I first met her, I thought that she lacked confidence. You know, I feel like she wasn't comfortable in her own skin. Very quiet, but I also know Jade had some issues at home and contributed that to why she was so quiet. Jade and Brandy had met online and began dating right after high school. But Jade didn't have the support of her family in the way that Brandy had with her mom. Jade's parents were very conservative and when she came out as lesbian, they weren't happy. They thought that they could fix her. Meanwhile, Brandy gave Jade the complete support that she didn't have at home. Brandy loved Jade very much and did a lot for her, but some people didn't feel as if Jade reciprocated in the same way. It was tough uh, because I felt that Brandy could do so much better. The relationship between Brandy and Jade did eventually come to an end after Jade stole from her. However, they still remained in contact. Brandy seemed to want Jade back despite what she had done. They did go back and forth a lot. Was it toxic? It was unhealthy because Jade knew that Brandy would do anything for her. Jade was taking advantage of her. Mm -hmm. And Brandy did do a lot for Jade, sometimes even picking her up from Maryland and driving her back to Ohio. Even though Jade was still talking to Brandy, she had reunited with her ex-girlfriend, Ashley Barber. Ashley and Jade had dated before Jade dated Brandy. Ashley was very tough. She liked to put out there that no one could mess with her. She was aggressive. At the time, Ashley was 18 years old and Jade was 20. They were both living with Ashley's parents. Even though Jade and Brandy were just friends, Ashley didn't like it. She was jealous and she didn't want to share Jade with anyone else. Ultimately, Brandy's decision to remain friends with Jade would cost her everything. It all started on a Sunday morning in the spring. Brandy told her grandmother that she was going to visit her close friend, Rhiannon. But instead of heading in the direction of where Rhiannon lived, she drove 80 miles to a different location. She had mentioned to Rhiannon that she felt uneasy about where she was going, but continued on her way anyway. She did text Rhiannon the location of where she was headed before getting there. That night, Brandy's grandma happened to look in her bedroom and noticed that she had left her backpack behind. This was extremely concerning because Brandy was a diabetic and the medication that she needed was inside that bag. What does her grandmother do? Her grandmother uh, began calling her cell phone 
and the calls went straight to voicemail. When Brandy didn't return by the next morning and still hadn't responded to any calls, Brandy's grandmother decided that it was time to tell Brandy's mother. Brandy's mother hadn't heard from her either. Yes. When you learned she left her diabetes medication behind. Yes, I, I freaked. Brandy's mom and grandma reported her missing. While the police began their search, Brandy's mom starts doing her own search. She pulled up Brandy's cell phone records and began reaching out to anyone that had been in contact with her. Meanwhile, Brandy's friend, Christy, was also growing concerned. Her very closest friend, Rhiannon, said that Brandy texted her that morning and said she had a bad feeling and here's the address. Rhiannon sent Christy the address that Brandy had given her and Christy decided to go look for her on her own. It was at night and she was alone, but there was nothing stopping her. She ended up getting lost herself. I ended up at a church, vacant, overgrown, full of grass, and it just solidified the, the hopelessness that I felt. Like, there's no, there's no hope. Meanwhile, police were able to pinpoint where Brandy's cell phone had last pinged. They traced it to a particular street in Pennsylvania. Brandy's mom traveled there immediately and began going door to door, handing out missing person flyers to all who answered. Around this time, some of Brandy's other close friends had become suspicious about Ashley Barber and Jade Olmstead. I think Ashley was very insecure. She couldn't stand the thought of Jade giving attention to someone else. They also knew that prior to Brandy's disappearance, Ashley had sent a horrific and threatening message about her. And I hope I get to kill her before her diabetes does. What did you do with that message? Did you take that threat seriously? At the time, no, because people say a lot of things when they're upset. Sarah, the friend that knew Ashley had sent this message, started to wonder if Ashley really could have made good on her promise to do something to Brandy. She checked Ashley's recent social media posts, and sure enough, she noticed some weird markings on her arms. Could they be defense wounds caused by Brandy? It just seemed a little bit too coincidental that Brandy was missing, and now Ashley has bruises all over her. Christy is still determined to find Brandy, and so along with Brandy's mom, she decides to give it another shot. She types the address that Brandy said she was going to into her GPS, and they follow it there. This time, the GPS leads her directly to Ashley Barber's parents' house. You arrive to the house and you're met outside. Yes. By Ashley and Jade and Ashley, her father. Ashley's father. What do they say to you? Jade came up to me. Ashley stayed back, and I, you know where I'm here. No, I don't. Well, you know, Brandy's been missing. Well, yeah, but she's not here. I said, well, she was coming here. We have a text saying that she had a bad feeling, but this is the address that she'll be at. So this was the last, last known place of her location. So I said she was here. No, she never made it here, she said. While Brandy's mom was standing there talking to Jade, she did lean over and notice that Ashley was injured and had multiple bandages on her arm. She also said they had been at the hospital when Brandy was supposed to be coming, but she had ultimately decided to turn back. Of course, all of this is pretty sketchy and it doesn't really make sense. I was very aggressive with Jade. I finally told her, I don't believe a thing you're saying. And that's when Ashley came up from behind Jade and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, don't whoa, whoa, whoa me. I said, my daughter's been missing for five days. This is the last known place that she was at. Brandy's mom and Christy finally decided that because they're not getting anywhere, they need to go directly to the police. The police interview both Jade and Ashley and they tell the same story they told earlier. Of course, everyone is frustrated because it is clear that someone is lying here. But the next day, an unbelievable discovery in the Barber's family garage would change the course of the case. Ashley's mother had gone out to the garage and saw that there was a car there. She didn't recognize the car, so she ended up calling the police. At this point, she knew that the police were looking for Brandy and must have known this car was involved. Sure enough, the blue key in the garage belonged to Brandy. But the car, which Brandy's mom said was typically messy and full of different things, was completely empty. This only further convinced her that something terrible must have happened. So Brandy's car is found. Yes. It's a rather messy vehicle. Right. But everything is cleaned out of it. It's almost as if it's brand new. 
Yes, it's been staged, it's been cleaned. Obviously, both Jade and Ashley are looking incredibly guilty at this point. They told everyone that Brandy had never arrived, and yet here was her car, sitting in the garage. Police are thinking they are finally close to getting some answers here for yet another shocking thing to happen. They headed over in the morning to talk to Jade and Ashley, only to discover that they were gone. Instead, they, in fact, went missing in the middle of the night, had packed their belongings and left the residence. So now, there are three missing people, Brandy, Ashley, and Jade. It was clear to the police that Ashley and Jade were on the run. They were trying to leave town, but it wouldn't be long before the police managed to catch up with them. An off-duty state trooper sees these two young females getting ready to get into a car and immediately knew these are the two women that our criminal investigators are looking for. They ended up taking both girls in for questioning and separated them. This way, they could try to get to the bottom of the investigation. I started out interviewing Ms. Barber and she wasn't being truthful with me. Ashley ends up changing her original story. She says that Brandy did end up coming, but left the home to go meet up with another woman named Jamie. She said that Brandy didn't want anyone else to know that she was planning on meeting this woman. Ashley also said that when Brandy first arrived at the house, they all played video games together until Brandy supposedly got a phone call which she took outside. She said that Brandy came back looking totally thrilled and took off to meet the woman on foot. They both stuck to the story that uh, Ms. Stevens had showed up and was running off to meet another young lady who was never seen from again. Ashley becomes even more unbelievable when she changes the story once again, this time involving her own father. She tells police that she, Jade, and Brandy had all gone out to the woods and were hanging together when her dad came down to meet them. She said he was mad that Brandy's vehicle was at his property and that he and Brandy ended up getting into it. And he says some disparaging things about lesbians and homosexuality. Barbara says that her father and Brandy end up getting in a fight. It's Ashley's father who uses the shovel and attacks Brandy Steve. This doesn't make any sense for a lot of different reasons. After all, we're talking about a man whose daughter is gay and he is not only accepting of her, but is also allowing her partner to live in his house with her. Doesn't sound like someone who's going to be making disparaging remarks about homosexuality. Investigators ended up searching the woods behind the Barber family property and they eventually find a spot where there is loose dirt and it appears that a hole has recently been dug. They see an area where it looks like somebody was making a, a cabin or a, or a campsite, and there's some fresh dirt that it looks like there had been a hole dug. They rope off the area and consider it a crime scene and eventually begin to dig in that area. It doesn't take long at all before they realize a human has been buried in the ground. That human was identified as Brandy Stevens. The police now had to inform her heartbroken mother. It was awful. It was the worst night ever. By the time Jade and Ashley find out that the body has been located, they change their tune. Ashley says she's ready to tell the truth, but only if she has a chance to talk to Jade first. Investigators allow her to do so. Ashley, let's clean the slate and just tell me what happened. It was planned. How did you get Brandy to the house? We just told her that we were gonna hang out. As it would turn out, Jade had messaged Brandy and told her that they were planning to build a fort in the woods and invited her down to check it out. When she arrived, Jade greeted her and led Brandy down to where Ashley was waiting. And I came down and Jade had her arm around her neck. So I came up and I punched her in the face. I don't know how many times, but I know it broke her nose. Brandy was screaming. Do you know what she was saying, Ashley? Jade, stop it. I won't tell anybody. Just let it go now. I, I told people where I was. But the girls didn't give up. Both girls continued to mercilessly beat Brandy. All the while, she continued to fight back with all the strength she had and begged for her life. While all of this is going on, Ashley is very much aware that her neighbor was cutting his grass not far away. If Brandy was able to get his attention, it would be all over. I knew if she ran, I was not able to catch her. Plus, you know, her car being there and stuff. So I started beating her head off the tree stump. That's when the blood started coming. And this is when Jade grabs for a shovel and begins to beat Brandy's head with it. How many times would you say you hit her with the shovel? Oh, I don't know, like four times. Okay. And that's why Ashley has bruises on her arms because I accidentally hit her while she was holding Brandy down. Was anything being said either by you, Ashley, or Brandy? <laughs> Brandy was screaming 
for her life. That's right. The bruises on Ashley's arms weren't defense wounds made by Brandy. Rather, they were accidentally made by Jade. At this point, Ashley grabbed a rope and started to tie it around Brandy's neck and pull, all the while Jade is continuing to bash her head with a shovel. And what was Brandy's reaction after that? She went limp, but she was gasping for air. Okay. And she was saying, Jade, stop, Jade, stop. It's clear in the interviews that there is a difference between the two girls. Jade was emotional and seemed to display some sort of feeling about what had gone on, but Ashley, just appeared angry. The girl was laying in a puddle of her own blood. So oh, you're I started saying, getting angry. What do you think made you angry about that? That she wasn't fighting anymore. It was then that Ashley slammed Brandy's head against the stump again, repeatedly. After already savagely beating her, the girls then pushed Brandy's body into a shallow grave they had already dug before Brandy arrived. This is the kind of evil that is difficult to even comprehend. Who could do this to an innocent person? I picked up a big boulder because I could tell that she was still breathing. And I walked over to the top of the grave and I smashed her face in. If you thought that this couldn't get worse or even more sadistic, you'd be wrong. That's because the girls then took a water bottle they had with them and began pouring it into Brandy's mouth and nose in an attempt to drown her. At this point, the girls seemed to have had enough fun and began covering up their tracks by burying Brandy with dirt. Do you think she was still alive when you buried her? I don't know, I don't know. Ultimately, this was a horrific way to die at the hands of someone Brandy once loved. After expressing little if no remorse for their actions, both Jade and Ashley were charged with Brandy's murder. They pled guilty and were sentenced to life in prison without parole. Even though the girls never explicitly said what their motive was, investigators had their own ideas. I always believed that it was their crazy attempt to show one another how much they cared for each other. Jade Olmstead had explained to the state police that Ashley Barber was very jealous and I believe when Ashley found out that Jade was still communicating with Brandy, they decided that she had to go. Brandy Stevens wasn't bothering these two people, and they basically lured her here to murder her. Both Ashley and Jade will be spending the rest of their lives behind bars, while those who loved Brandy are left to celebrate her memory. Meanwhile, Sarah, Brandy's friend that was aware of the threatening statement that Ashley made about Brandy, is haunted by the thoughts of how she could have done things differently. If she had taken the threat seriously and reported it to the police, would things have been different? There's no telling now. It definitely taught me a lot more to pay attention to the things that people say. I feel like had I said something, this wouldn't have happened. Brandy's mother is of course also haunted by the thought of what could have been, but she does say that there's a lesson that everyone needs to take away from this. If something seems off, it probably is. Listen to your gut. You have a bad feeling, don't just text somebody, I have a bad feeling, this is where I'll be if something happens to me. If you have a bad feeling, don't go. Meanwhile, Christy wants people to remember this soul, not for what happened to her, but for who she was as a human being, and what a wonderful human being she was. She was taken in such an ugly way for such a beautiful person. It's, it's shocking, but I don't want her to be remembered by how she was taken. I want her to, to be remembered as who she was before. You're a good friend. Thanks. Brandy would have done it for me. Rest in peace, Brandy Stevens Razine. If you thought this story of teen girls who murdered their ex-partners was twisted, buckle up, because we have another one coming up next. Twenty-four-year-old Abby Gay White and twenty-two-year-old Bradley Lewis had three children and lived in Kingswood, a town in south of England. Abby Gay was better known as Barbie Fake and earned more than 5,000 euros a month through the adult site OnlyFans. For most, that amount of money would be enough to solve any problem and have a happier life, but not for the couple Abigail and Brad. According to friends and family close to the two, their relationship was very peaceful in the beginning, but as time went by, it became increasingly troubled. Obviously, I have no limit when I get angry, and like obviously he said that I need help with that because people are generally saying to me one of you are going to end up dead like and i fully believe that i'm quite capable of killing him 
or I'm gonna end up being in prison. The OnlyFans model, Abby White, said these haunting words just weeks before taking the life of her own former partner. This wasn't the sort of murder that came out of nowhere. There were lots of red flags leading up to what occurred, but it is still hard to wrap your head around how someone could kill a person they share children with. Bradley Lewis, the victim in this case, grew up in a loving home and had a happy childhood. He loved football and was well liked by all who knew him. He was a much loved young man with a fantastic personality, and his large number of friends reflected on this fact. He was exactly what you'd expect from any young British lad, and that is that he loved his mates, enjoyed goofing around. Bradley ended up first setting his eyes on Abby when she was a senior, and he was only 14 years old. The two began dating just two years later, but Abby and Bradley had grown up experiencing two very different childhoods. While Bradley's had been happy, Abby was one of domestic violence. As a result, she struggled with extreme mental and emotional problems. When she got older, she turned to OnlyFans as her main income instead of trying to pursue a different career. It wasn't long before she began making lots and lots of money. Unfortunately for her, this revenue didn't last due to how competitive OnlyFans is. It was during these drops that she relied on Bradley's income. Because of their multiple children, this income was especially important. The relationship between Abby and Bradley was extremely turbulent. Not only did she partake in illegal use, but she was also known to frequently consume alcohol rather heavily. Both Bradley and Abby were said to have been unfaithful to one another during the time they were together. Abigail was also nauseatingly egotistical, and despite most of her social media accounts now being deleted, her currently still viewable TikTok account portrays the image of a young mother who takes no account of her actions, and instead makes public posts out of resentment and negativity. Abigail would also regularly record Bradley on social media to try to make him look bad. I can't believe a word that comes out of that boy's mouth. I have to beat the living daylights out of him for him to tell me the truth, and he still doesn't tell me the truth. He only tells me the truth when he thinks I'm gonna kill him. As could probably be predicted, one of the couple's worst fights did end up with Bradley being brutally. However, he was about to get help in time and never told the police the truth about what happened. Still, those who knew the couple were aware of the abuse that was going on and begged Bradley to get out. Maybe it was due to his commitment to his own family that he never did. On March 25th of 2021, the relationship changed forever. At 8.10pm, a distressed scream erupted from the home, and that scream was coming from Abigail. Emergency services were called, and when they arrived at the home, they found Bradley on the floor having been to death. A bloody knife was lying next to him. Not long after reaching the hospital, he was pronounced dead. Abby was rather quickly identified as the suspect, but she denied having anything to do with the murder. She said that Bradley had actually intended to take his own life, and she had to intervene before he ended up stabbing himself through the chest. Nevertheless, she was eventually arrested and charged with murder. It was confirmed that she had not only been using co but also had been drinking at the time of Bradley's death. But there was more that came out in court that made her look even worse, including a text message where she said, I swear to God, I'll stab you. As the evidence against her grew, Abby eventually did change her story and said that she picked up the knife and stabbed Bradley, despite never intending to hurt him. Because she admitted this, she was charged with manslaughter instead of murder and found guilty in October of 2022. She has not yet been sentenced, but could be spending the rest of her life behind bars. If you thought this story was horrific, this next one will shock you to your core. A pair of siblings who killed a 15-year-old learned their fate. A judge sentenced 17-year-old Kyle Hooper and his sister Amber Wright to life in prison. The two were found guilty of beating, shooting, and burning the body of 15-year-old Seth Jackson. Wright and Hooper were part of a plot to kill Jackson in Marion County last year. Seth Jackson was born on February 3rd of 1996, and due to the actions of others, he never made it to his 16th birthday. His problem started when he began dating Amber Wright. The pair were only together for a few months months after going through a messy breakup when Seath suspected that Amber was cheating on him with then 
18-year-old Michael Fargo. Their breakup was extremely messy and played out on social media for all to see. It even infiltrated their families. There was extreme hatred between Michael and Seth, due partially because he believed Seth had been abusing Amber. One thing led to another, and before long, Michael, Amber, Amber's brother Kyle, and two others were planning Seth's murder. Together, they ended up luring Seth to the home of Charlie Eli, a mutual friend. It was there that they lunged at Seth and brutally attacked him. Michael then grabbed a gun and started shooting at Seth, injuring him. Seth made it outside of the home, but was then attacked by Justin Soto, who had been in on the plan. He was then shot and beaten some more before he was dragged back inside and thrown into the bathtub, where they continued their horrific assault until Seth was dead. They then wrapped Seth up in a sleeping bag and threw him into a fire pit. Justin Havens, the ex-boyfriend of Amber Wright's mom, even helped them dispose of the evidence. Not long after, the news played a report about Seth's disappearance, and when Kyle saw it, he caved and told his mother everything. The police were notified, and everyone that had been involved in the murder were taken into custody. Michael was the only one who managed to skip town after driving to a different city. But when he got there, he bragged about the murder in gory detail to everyone that would listen. He was reported and arrested the next day. Meanwhile, Seth's remains were recovered from the fire pit. Justin Havens was found guilty of accessory to murder, while others were charged with murder and received life sentences. Michael was sentenced to death. Well, just 30 minutes ago, the judge sentenced 16-year-old Amber Wright to life in prison. She chose not to speak on her own behalf, refused to look at pictures of Seth Jackson that were put on the screen. In the same courtroom hours earlier, her brother, Kyle Hooper, got the same sentence. Seth's mother had the opportunity to take the stand and she did not hold back. After being beaten and shot several times, Seth still managed to run outside where Kyle, again, made a choice to continue with the plan <laughs> and bring Seth back inside. knowing he would not live. While his sister did not choose to speak during her sentencing, Kyle did. Kyle Hooper himself took the stand. He was soft-spoken, apologized. I know it may not help or bring him back in any, in any way, but I, I, I am sorry. The judge presiding over the case did not sympathize with these teens when sentencing them. This case is the single most cold calculated, premeditated case of murder that I have ever seen. Charlie Eli was likely going to spend the rest of her life behind bars, but after filing an appeal, she was released in 2020, having spent nine years of her life behind bars. And so there we have it the truly horrific murder cases that occurred at the hands of young people and dozens of other lives affected as a result. 